This is uh, my kitchen table and also my filing system. Over much of the past three decades, I've been an investor. The highest calling of mankind, I've often thought, was private equity. <laughs> and then I started interviewing. And while I watch your interview, because I know how to do some interviews. <laughs> I've learned in doing my interviews how leaders make it to the top. I asked him how much he wanted. He said 250. I said fine. I didn't negotiate with him. I did no due diligence. Told I have me. something I'd like to sell. <laughs> and how they stay there. You don't feel inadequate now because being only the second wealthiest man in the world. Is that right? <laughs> Perhaps the toughest job in Washington is not being President of the United States, it's actually being Chief of Staff to the President of the United States. The average Chief of Staff to the President of the United States lasts about 18 months. I sat down recently with Ron Klain, the current Chief of Staff to the President of the United States, and asked him what this job actually entails and why it's so difficult. For those who don't know Ron's background, it's quite amazing. He's actually served his country for many, many years, and among those positions are Chief Counsel for the Senate Judiciary Committee under then-Chairman Joe Biden, Associate Counsel for Judicial Selection under President Clinton, Chief of Staff and Counselor to the Attorney General Janet Reno, Staff Director of the Senate Democratic Leadership Committee under Leader Tom Daschle, and Chief of Staff to Vice President Al Gore. In addition, uh, he also served as Assistant to the President and Chief of Staff to Vice President Biden in the Obama administration and returned after serving several years in that position to serve as the White House Ebola Response Coordinator. I think you've got the perfect resume for this job, but my question is, you know so much about being Chief of Staff to people and you know so much about the White House. Don't you know that being Chief of Staff to the White House uh, President of the United States is a difficult job to do and usually the tenure is about 18 months. So when you were offered the job, did you say, I know I'm only going to be able to do this for about 18 months, or do you say I'm going to make it all four or eight years? Well, uh, David, thanks. Thanks for that very generous introduction. I appreciate it. Uh, look, I uh, was honored and flattered and humbled when President Biden, President-elect Biden, asked me to come do this. Um, it is a grueling job. There's no question about it. I think it's easy to understand why the average tenure in the job is 17, 18 months. Uh, you know, I'm here every day working away. I'm honored to be part of this team. I have I'm very lucky. I have probably the most experienced a group of colleagues who've ever served at a senior level in the White House. I have people who carry a lot of the load every day that makes the job a lot easier than it would be. Uh, we're facing a lot of hard challenges, no question about it. Difficult situations on the international front, a lot of challenges here at home, uh, but I'm really lucky to be part of, a, of an A-plus team that's tackling these challenges every day. So let's talk about the job of being chief of staff and how the White House works. So. The president, does he get up early in the morning and call you at home and say, what's going on? Or, or do you, you get in? What, what time does he get in? And what time do you meet with the staff people? And what time do you see him in the beginning and the end of the day? How does that work? So uh, I'm usually in the White House every day by 645. Uh, and uh, I talk to the president early in the morning by phone from the residents. Uh, we have our morning staff meetings before the president comes downstairs. We have a, a number of different kinds of alignments of meetings, depending on the day of the week and whatnot. Um, where we kind of go over what's going to happen that day, what's going to, what the key questions are that need to be put to the president, uh, what are the key things we need to resolve that day as a team. Uh, as I said, this is a, uh, I've worked in the White House many times before, um, but I think this is the most team-oriented staff uh, I've seen. Uh, usually the president comes downstairs uh, around 9 o'clock. Uh, I'm uh, his first meeting of the day every day. I kind of go through where things are and some key priorities, get his a reaction to the materials he's been reading overnight. The president takes with him upstairs every evening a thick binder of materials to read, uh, decision memos, um, and briefing memos. Those He usually comes in with questions. Uh, I try to come in with answers, uh, and uh, we have a conversation. Then he proceeds to a number of different staff meetings. I see him a number of times during the day for different kinds of meetings that are going on, whether they're national security meetings or domestic policy meetings. Uh, and then usually, uh, at the end of the day, I come in and kind of uh, wrap with him on, uh, you know, what are the key outstanding things? What are the things he's going to see in his book that night that he really needs to focus on? Uh, and what are the big uh, decisions he's going to have to make in some of the meetings he's going to have the next day? And uh, today, um, does anybody have the right or the senior staff? Who has walk-in privileges? Are you the only one that can walk into the Oval Office without an announcement? Or are there a couple people that can do that? Now, any of the president's senior advisors, senior policy advisors can come in and see him. Obviously, you know, it's, he's got to not be in another meeting or whatever, but 
But uh, I, I, we run a White House here where a lot of people have access to the president and a lot of people are able to talk to him straight and directly about what they think uh, without having to go through me. So um, the president seems like an even-tempered person, but you know everybody gets upset from time to time. Does he yell and scream, or he's not a yeller and screamer? How does he show his displeasure at something? You write a note to him or, he, or to you, or how does he show, say he's not happy? I think one of Joe Biden's great strengths as president is that he has lived a life filled with incredible triumphs and incredible tragedies. And um, people know his biography. They know his background. Uh, they know the successes he's had. They know the grave personal setbacks he suffered. And one thing that is true is there's never a morning I go in there with news that's as bad or worse than the news someone else has had to deliver to him at other points in time in his life. And I think that gives him a very even keel. I think when things are going well, he doesn't get too uh, hyped up. And when, when we're having tougher days, uh, he maintains that composure, that demeanor. And uh, I think that's one of the hallmarks of his temperament, uh, one of the things he brings to the office, that, that uh, steadiness, that experience, uh, and, uh, and a life uh, that has been, as I say, filled with triumph and tragedy, uh, and that's uh, seasoned him and prepared him for this moment. Some people say he's, you know, it's 79 years old. That's old to be president of the United States. Do you see signs of his age? Uh, is he uh, in better shape than you are in terms of exercising? Or how do you uh, deal with the fact that he's, you know, older than anybody's ever been to be president of the United States? Well, he's, A, he's definitely in better shape than I am. That's for sure. He's very fit. He works out almost every day in the morning before he uh, comes down to the Oval Office. Uh, and I think the American people saw for themselves last night the President Stan to give an hour-long address uh, that was filled with passion and power and uh, wisdom and energy. Uh, they saw him hold the longest press conference in the history of presidents uh, a couple weeks ago at the start of the year, a two-hour press conference where he took questions from all kinds of reporters. So I think his fitness, his vigor uh, is beyond question. Uh, people see him on the job every day, uh, and then what they see is a person who's fully capable of doing the job, fully vigorous and great mental and physical health uh, and taking on the burdens of the office and executing them well. So uh, today, uh, you would say the president enjoying the job or does he say, geez, I wish I hadn't really done this? Well, I don't know that enjoying is the way you describe tackling the responsibilities of being the president of the United States, and particularly now where I think he has emerged as the leader of the free world, as the person who's leading this coalition that's confronting Vladimir Putin. But I think he's very glad he ran for president. I think he is, uh, you know, been well prepared for the challenges he's tackling. I think more importantly, I hear from people all around the country, Democrats and Republicans, that they're very glad he's the person in the Oval Office right now, that he's the person with the background, the experience, the judgment to tackle these hard problems. And uh, so I, I think there's a lot of confidence in him uh, as the person who should be where he is. Is the Build Back Better bill likely to ever see the light of day in the Senate, or are you now committed to breaking it up and passing individual pieces of it? Well, I think what we're going to try to do is get as many of the president's initiatives enacted as possible in the best way possible. About intelligence for a moment. Um, usually, uh, the intelligence that comes into the CIA uh, is not declassified and given to reporters in a public way. Clearly, in this process, somebody, I assume the President of the United States, thought it was a good idea to declassify the, the satellite photos and to declassify the information we have about what Putin was thinking or saying. So was that a difficult decision to come to, and do you think it worked or didn't work yet? David, I think it was uh, the right decision, uh, given the kind of environment we were facing. Uh, we knew that President Putin had a reputation for disinformation. Uh, we've certainly seen that all around the world. And we knew that his most likely approach here would be to create some kind of uh, disinformation campaign, a false flag attack potentially, a false provocation, out-and-out -out lies, to justify uh, his invasion of Ukraine. As it became clearer and clearer to us, that that was what he had planned, we thought it was more and more important to strip him of that advantage by making clear what we knew his plans were and making it clear to the world what we thought would happen. 
And I think that decision by President Biden, in conjunction with our NATO allies, our other allies that are part of the coalition, a shared decision to proceed this way, has been one of the reasons why there has been such a unified and uniform world reaction to what President Putin has done. There's no ambiguity about who is the aggressor here. There's no belief in any of the false stories about what, quote unquote, provoked uh, this invasion. I think that transparency, that uh, sophisticated use of intelligence in a modern information warfare context has served uh, the allies very, very well. I also think it stripped President Putin of any element of surprise in the attack and helped uh, the Ukrainians be ready uh, for what, what has hit them. So how do you respond to the critics that you have, and you have some critics sometimes, I'm sure you know, who say you should have sent armaments to the uh, Ukrainians before the invasion, so they were better armed than they are now, though we're now sending them uh, after the invasion, and, and that you should have imposed the sanctions before the uh, invasion occurred. What do you respond, how do you respond to those kind of criticisms? Well, first of all, we did send armaments to the Ukrainians before the invasion. Uh, we sent more arms, more military assistance to Ukraine uh, in the past uh, 12 months than any year uh, since 2014. So uh, we ha did send a, a variety of kinds of military assistance to the Ukrainians. That assistance continues uh, to be uh, to come into the country, but we did send uh, plenty before uh, this happened. In terms of the sanctions, uh, we thought that the best way to uh, make sure we'd have the most unified and powerful set of sanctions was to make it clear that those sanctions would take effect when and if uh, President Putin invaded. The results that we've seen uh, illustrate that, David. You've seen there, there's never been a effort to impose sanctions this stringent on a country as large and as complex and as interconnected to the world economy as Russia. It's really a, a kind of an astonishing effort that you're seeing underway here. And the impact of those sanctions uh, has been devastating. They're devastating because they're such a, a powerful group of countries uh, unified in their application. And I think uh, doing it the way we did is what's made all that possible. When you impose sanctions, uh, let's suppose the offending party, let's say Russia, says, OK, we made a mistake. We're sorry. We're pulling back. Did the sanctions go away or are there penalties that are subsequent to the uh, withdrawal? In other words, are there ongoing penalties or are there, in effect, reparations for having done these bad things or did the sanctions just go away or is that not decided yet? Hasn't been decided yet what would happen if the Russians withdrew. Uh, again, that'd be part of whatever kind of diplomacy would unwind uh, the crisis in Ukraine. Uh, sadly, uh, this, is a, this, as you say, is a hypothetical question. We see no signs, unfortunately, that the Russians have any intention of withdrawing right now. And indeed, their military operations in Ukraine continue to escalate. They continue to um, you know, at uh, attack more civilians, uh, more civilian sites. Uh, the fighting continues to get more and more fierce. So we offered President Putin a number of diplomatic off-ramps in the run-up to this invasion. We offered him a number of different arrangements, a number of different possible ways in which he could meet with uh, members of the coalition and the Ukrainians, a number of different uh, kinds of structures to do that. Uh, at every juncture, President Putin rejected the path of diplomacy, uh, continued on the path uh, of invasion, and that's what we're seeing unfold right now. Let's talk about Build Back Better. Um, I wondered who came up with that tongue twister. Um, it's hard to say that quickly. Um, was that something that you came up with, or who came up with that? I don't know who came up with it. Certainly, it was the principal slogan for the president's campaign uh, in uh, 2020. Uh, it was uh, uh, the slogan for most of his policies. It was the umbrella under which most of the policies uh, that he ran on, Build Back Better. Uh, it's actually gained some traction around the world. Uh, a number of European countries have now adopted Build Back Better initiatives. So I think it's a slogan that's uh, resonated with people. Uh, it is a bit of a tongue twister, but I think it does have some resonance and it comes from the campaign. So is the Build Back Better bill that passed the House likely to ever see the light of day in the Senate? Or are you now committed to breaking it up and passing individual pieces of it? Well, I think what we're going to try to do is get as many of the president's initiatives enacted as possible in the best way possible. Uh, the Senate has the option to do reconciliation as a procedural device that takes only 50 votes to pass. Uh, a bill that has tax changes and other kinds of economic changes in it. Uh, and that would probably be the vehicle we'd use uh, to move some legislation like this through the Senate. 
uh, we're obviously in conversations with a number of senators about what elements have the most support, what elements uh, are uh, the most effective to get passed to the Senate. You heard the president talk about a number of those last night, David. I think people are very concerned about inflation and very concerned about what inflation means to everyday families. And that means uh, they pay too much for things. And so uh, key parts of uh, the Build Back Better plan uh, address that directly. Bring down the cost of child care. Bring down the cost of prescription drugs. Bring down the cost of elder care. Bring down the cost of health care. Uh, so we're looking for, and, of, and most importantly in some ways, or equally importantly, I should say, bring down the cost of energy by moving us to more of a clean energy economy. So uh, you look at those proposals. There are proposals that meet the moment of higher costs, and we're going to continue to work with the Senate to find a formula that moves that agenda forward. So, Ron, uh, you have uh, been criticized by some for saying that uh, you are so powerful that you really are effectively running the uh, whole government. How do you respond to that? You're like you're the prime minister. It's ridiculous. Uh, I'm a staff person. I've been a staff person my whole life. I've never run for anything. I've never been elected to anything. I've been proud to work for some distinguished public servants, uh, President Biden being one of them at several points in time in my career, uh, President Obama, of course, President Clinton. Uh, uh, that's, that's who I am. And at the White House, uh, not only am I a staff person, uh, I'm a staff person who works with a number of other enormously talented staff people. So uh, this is a real team effort here, team on the policy side, team on the strategy side. Uh, my job is just to help coordinate those people, get that advice to the president. Uh, so uh, so that, that's how I see my role. How do you respond to the other criticisms that some people have had, not necessarily of you, but of the president, that he governed as he, he campaigned as a moderate, but he's governing more to the left than people expected. And what is your response to that uh, criticism that some have made? Yeah, look, I think that that criticism uh, wipes out the history of the 2020 campaign. Uh, there's nothing that the president has sent to Capitol Hill that he did not put before the voters in the 2020 campaign. Our economic agenda is the economic agenda he ran on and 81 million Americans voted for when they elected him. In fact, if anything, we've trimmed that agenda back. Uh, the Build Back Better plan that we sent to Capitol Hill was significantly smaller than even the one we campaigned on. Uh, the infrastructure bill is something he campaigned on. Uh, the voting rights bill is something he campaigned on. And the COVID relief package that we started the administration with, again, is something he endorsed in the campaign. So he was very straightforward with voters about what he would do if he were president. And that's what he's done. And look, it, 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 the, the, the proposals we put forward are substantial. Why? because the problems we inherited were substantial. It's not any vision and not any grandiose vision. We inherited an economy that was dead in the water. Uh, 50,000 jobs a month, just 50,000 jobs a month the three months before we got here, virtually dead economy. Uh, the government hadn't even bought enough vaccinations to give one vaccine to every American, let alone two vaccines to every American, let alone booster shots. Uh, we had no system to really massively distribute and administer those vaccines. Uh, we face a climate crisis. Uh, we face all kinds of other challenges. Now, obviously, this challenge over in Europe. So we've put together proposals to meet the moment, not out of some uh, effort to kind of do something bigger than we should, but because we inherited very big problems. Uh, and, and you've seen a lot of progress. We obviously then went and created more jobs in one year than any administration in history, or any administration since 1939, according to a New York Times fact check. So any administration since 1939. We uh, see the fastest economic growth in 40 years. Uh, was the first time in 20 years our economy grew faster in a year than China's economy. So we put in place the kind of recovery measures that were needed. We vaccinated over 220, fully vaccinated over 220 million Americans. Uh, you know, th these are big tasks we took on this year, and I'm proud of what we've done to achieve them. So uh, usually in the, after the first year of an administration, uh, you see some turnover in a cabinet or something, but you haven't had any turnover and I haven't had any scandals either. So uh, how come you haven't had any scandals and how come you haven't had any turnover? Well, uh, 
I think the president did a very good job of picking a cabinet and picking senior officials, and I think the lack of scandals reflects that. Uh, I think the lack of turnover reflects the fact that uh, these are men and women uh, who are very eager to serve, uh, who are doing a great job, who are making a difference. Uh, it's the most diverse cabinet in history. It's the first time in history the cabinet's been evenly divided between men and women. The first time in history that a majority of the cabinet uh, isn't white. And uh, it's a diverse cabinet. It's an incredibly talented cabinet. And we're very lucky to have their service. The president's favorability ratings are not as high as I assume you would like. And uh, I wondered, how do you in the White House deal with that? Well, I think the most important thing is for the president to do the right thing. And uh, I think that what you're seeing right now is um, a mood in the country that's impacted by the fact that this pandemic has lasted longer than anyone thought it would, uh, that while we've had tremendous growth on uh, the economy and jobs, we're having a problem with inflation. And I think those things contribute to um, a generally um, uh, a mood in the country that's not as upbeat or confident as we would like. What I think in the case of President Biden is we made a lot of hard decisions in 2021 to put in place a new economic strategy that you heard the president talk about last night in the State of the Union, a new COVID strategy that we're again uh, updating again today with new steps on COVID. Uh, and those hard decisions, I think, are starting to show results. Uh, I fully accept the fact that the American people uh, are more show me, not tell me. And what they want to see is they want to see that we really have reached a new way of managing COVID. They want to see we really have not just created jobs, but the jobs are going to stay. The wages are going to go up. They want to see that these the re economic recovery is real and sustained. I think the political credit will follow from that. Uh, when I was here, both with President Clinton and President Obama, we saw the recovery ahead of the politics, and I think you're seeing that now too. And so I do think our approval rating will go up in the months ahead uh, as the economic recovery and the progress on COVID uh, become more permanent, more lasting, and internalized more by the voters. Now, one of my former uh, partners at, uh, at Carlisle was Jim Baker. And he was considered, uh, maybe up until you, the gold standard of how to be chief of staff. But he didn't actually like the job that much. And he wound up as secretary of treasury eventually and as secretary of state. So do you have any aspirations to any of those jobs or something like that? I don't think so. I think uh, when I finish my tenure here, I'll go back. Uh, I'll, when I finish my tenure here, I'm going to like take a month and sleep. And then I'll figure out what I'll do next. Uh, you know, Secretary Baker... I got to know him a little bit during the Florida recount when we were on opposite sides of that. He has been unbelievably gracious. He sent me the, the kindest note when I got this job. Um, he's sent me a couple other notes since then. Uh, he's just such a, uh, you know, he's just been, he's just such a wonderful person. Um, and um, uh, and I, he is the gold standard of doing this job. Uh, I couldn't even aspire to that. Uh, I just try to do the best I can every day. So whenever you do finish this position as uh, chief of staff, uh, and a friend calls you subsequently and says, I've been offered the job of chief of staff to the president of the United States. Would you tell him to take or her to take that job or not? I would definitely tell anyone to take this job. It is a hard job, but it's a unique opportunity to work with, first of all, an incredible president and vice president, of course, at a time that's very important to our country, and to work with an amazingly talented group of people here in the White House, throughout the agencies. Uh, they just blow me away every day, and I learn something new every day. Uh, it's been uh, the culminating experience of my career, uh, and um, I, um, I just couldn't be more grateful for the experience. And uh, whoever replaces me in this job, whenever my time in the job ends, uh, I hope uh, has, has the same kind of experience. 